Hello, everybody, and welcome to the This.Labs podcast, our podcast about demystifying software architecture and software development and all the things related to it. Uh, today, we are talking about security, because as you've seen through all these podcast episodes, we don't do small topics. We take the big topics and we take them head on. So today, we're talking about security. Uh, my name is Rob Osell. I'm a senior developer at This.Labs. I'm joined by uh, my regular co-host. So we have Tracy Lee, a founder at this stop. Tracy, how are you doing? Hello, good to see everyone. Also have Jared Overson, who's a director at Shape Security. Jared, how are you doing? Great, thank you very much. We have James Spivey, the director of engineering at Shutterstock. James, how are you doing today? Hello. And today, for the first time joining us on the This.Labs podcast, we have Frederick Precht, a uh, senior developer at this.labs as well with us. Frederick, how you doing? Hi, thanks. Great to be here. And I didn't roll the R well enough, Frederick. I'm sorry. I'll get it the next time. Yeah, we'll practice on it. Okay. So, uh, you know, what do we like to do on this podcast is start off with a bit, a bit of an icebreaker. So uh, we're talking about security. So I thought a decent icebreaker for today is to tell, talk about um, some time that we have had a security incident. Could be with software, could be in our real life could be whatever. And uh, I will tell the story uh, myself about the time that my ATM card got stolen. Well, not my ATM card, but my, my credentials, right? And so uh, I, it was while I was in college, actually. And I remember I got a phone call from my bank at like nine o'clock in the morning. And when you're in college, nine o'clock in the morning, might as well be six o'clock in the morning, right? And so, you know, just sort of tiredly asked, like, what, what do you want? And they're like, do you happen to be riding a train in Europe right now? I said, Absolutely not. Absolutely not riding a train in Europe. And they said, well, that's really odd because it seems like you are riding a train and every time you make a stop, you go out to an ATM and you withdraw a bit <laughs> of money and then you get back on the train. And I said, nope, definitely not me. Uh, can you please put all my money back? I need to go buy books. Uh, and uh, mercifully, my bank actually had you know fraud protection and I was able to get all that money back. But even though I can't, I, I never found out where the information got stolen from, but I have forever now judged a website that wants my credit card information since then. Like if it doesn't, if it looks even the hint sketchy, I'm like, I don't need that item. I don't need it. It's not important. All right. How about uh, Jared? How about, what, what do you got for us? Uh, I, I've got a lot of really good stories uh, that I can't talk about. Um, but uh, personally, uh, one thing that is notable is that I uh, remember Minecraft. It's a small, no-name game. Uh, came out like 10 years ago. Uh, it was weird, had blocky graphics. Uh, anyway, I, I joined the alpha and uh, played it because people would recommend it. It's like, this is stupid. It's not going to go anywhere. I used one of my throwaway passwords because at the time, I did not recognize that passwords were important. Um, and then after uh, many years later, Minecraft became a big thing. And I had children, and they grew up old enough to play games. So I was like, oh, I've got a Minecraft account. I can totally bond with you now. And I, I log in. Uh, I can't. And I had to I had to go through the reset process with Mojang um, and, and get my account back. And it was just somebody had uh, a, very likely that my password had been breached, and that password was reused on on sites that had the same password. So this was long ago, back when I had really crappy password practices all over the place. And I don't know, like Dark Star One or somebody had changed everything in there. Um, but it was it was an enlightening story that, that made me realize that even the, the stupidest little things uh, that I think mean nothing uh, are, are still important enough and to be uh, should be protected in better ways. For sure. How about Frederick? Do you have any interesting uh... Uh, security stories or, or, or mishaps that you have to share? Well, I used to work on a project when I joined the team. They had authentication uh, implemented um, using a JSON file that was served to the front end. And the front end was basically checking username and password in that file. So it was a file <laughs> that had all username and passwords. So when I joined, I think that was the first thing that I wanted to change. Um, we had a big discussion about the fact that we needed a company-wide security provider, like Auth0 or whatever. Uh, but I was like, I don't care. Let's at least put the JSON file in the back end to begin with and control username and password through the API, even though that's still not good. It's still better than sending the JSON file entirely to the front end. In the end, I ended up implementing a total key cloak, uh, which is also an identity provider. So I think they ended up with a great solution, but yeah. 
what they what they, what they started off with wasn't really <laughs> there you go a good idea how about james you got any uh, stories for us yeah i was struggling to come up with one and i realized i had a really obvious one uh i get an email a day pretty much where it lists my one of my old email addresses I don't really use anymore, and it includes a password that I've long ago since stopped using forever ago. And it says something to the effect in very poor English that my computer's been hacked and spyware's been added, and they're watching my camera, and they've got embarrassing things, even though I always unplug my camera, and they're going to expose them to the world unless I send them a whole bunch of Bitcoin. And I get one of these probably a day slight different variations, but it's always the same email and the same password. So clearly someone had it in clear text and that leaked and, you know, thus made it into the dark web. And now I'm being exploited mercilessly for Bitcoin. Yeah, that was the sextortion scam, if you ever need to refer to that by name. That is correct. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and Tracy, any interesting uh, security mishaps that you've experienced? Well, one time I, uh, you know, I left all my stuff in my, so I was doing stuff and I left my backpack in the car because I was walking around downtown, downtown Raleigh. And then, uh, you know, we go back to the car and it was a rental. It was my friend's rental. The car was not there. So we're like, oh my gosh, where is this car? It was stolen. How could a random car get stolen? And, you know, going in and out, in and out, trying to figure out what the heck is going on, called the police, everything like that. It wasn't until these drunk guys were in my lobby and they said, oh, yeah, I saw like, um, you know, a cop uh, like uh, giving tickets or towing away. It was this one because we we're like, oh, our, our car got stolen. And it's like, whoa, that's so crazy. Yeah, this other car I just saw was, you know, whatever. And we're like, wait, that was our car. So then we realized it was into the impound lot and it hadn't been like logged properly or something, but turns out the rental car, okay, this is a longer story. Turns out the rental car, <laughs> <laughs> the rental car um, company reported the car stolen because the other person hadn't returned it. So they gave a car that they had actually reported stolen. And so the police were scanning this thing. But the worst part is all my stuff was there, my passport, my laptop, everything, okay? Um, like social security paper things. And um, I was so worried that my identity was going to get stolen, but then I was so glad that the car was found. But guess what? A few weeks later, my identity got stolen. So I had signed up for this thing, this like monitoring system, and it started letting me know. But I'm like, dude, what the hell? My car wasn't even stolen and my identity got stolen. Like coincidence? I don't know, right? But I think my lesson was always freeze your credit. Like if you don't have your credit frozen now, you should definitely freeze your credit because it's so easy to unfreeze, but it makes it so easy for people not to steal your credit. Wow. Good story. 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 Actually uh, on that too, I'm going to be, I'm going to be popping out so much here on this <laughs> podcast. Uh, if you have kids freeze their credit now too, because oh, there's yeah. no reason for them to be accruing anything. And, uh, it wouldn't stop uh, attackers from using your kids' identities to start building up credit over time. Well, there you go. So uh, jumping into the actual topic of security, I mean, we can start where, well, at the beginning and, and talk about like sort of why this matters, right? I mean, in some ways it's both obvious, but it's also non-obvious because we've seen a lot of projects probably that don't have security people or that security is like the thing you add on at the very, very end if there's time. Um, so the question is generally, you know, why does security matter? And when I thought about this, I thought about the fact that for me, like now you turn on the news every day and there is another, um, another story of another company that's leaking credentials or leaking data. And I think increasingly the public is actually uh, paying attention to this kind of stuff and companies are facing real repercussions for it. And there's been stories coming out now where uh, companies are using modern approaches now, but there's a set of um, accounts which were made with hand rolled solutions maybe six months or a year or two years or three years in the past that attackers were able to identify and then use that to attack the entire bank of credentials. So, you know, security is something you have to do right up front so you don't find yourself on the, the news. So, me, that, that, that's what security means. That's why security matters. Um, but you know, pitching it out. How about anybody else? Like, why why does security matter? Why should we think about it? Why should we care? Um, I'll I'll jump in. I think I think uh, 
when I was doing a lot of development, um, all of these topics were a cost versus value justification. So there's so many things you want to build, uh, so little time to build them all. And security just seems like one of those things that it's not a problem now. We can defer it for a little bit. Um, but the, the problem with deferring decisions that are related to security is that when it becomes a problem, it's usually too late. So a lot of the work kind of needs to go in in advance in order to make sure that you are ready to be able to do the right thing when you have to do the right thing. And uh, I, I think it's it can be decided much more of, on much more of a gradient than a lot of people think. So you don't need to go 100% in on making sure everything is, is uber secure, but you have to at least know what the problems are in order to be making the right decisions uh, the whole way. And and I, I think that it's it's a very, very, a uh, large umbrella that if you if you don't care about security, you are not caring about a huge amount of stuff. And uh, usually whenever you disregard something so large, you're probably wrong. And to further that, there's a really real cost to uh, ignoring it. You know, places like Target and all these others that have had substantial leaks you know, that's that's a lot of money that they end up having to spend on credit card monitoring, the PR, all of the fixing and emergencies uh, that, that come from a situation like that. Uh, those costs are immediate and they're very large and they're not as beneficial as just spending the money to focus on it up front so that you don't end up on the headlines, you know, in the news because you didn't pay attention to it enough or you thought, Oh, uh, well, that's expensive and we can worry about it later. Awesome. So Frederick, as a as a front end developer, right? Like for there might be front end developers that go, ah, the security stuff, right? Like that's that's server stuff, that's back end stuff, that's dev that's DevOps stuff. You know, I make websites and I work on CSS and I write some JavaScript. Like it's not my concern. Like, what do you say to people like that that think that security is really more of just a back end thing that, that front end developers don't have to worry about it? Well, obviously they do have to worry about security as well. It depends what kind of security. Of course, securing your API, that's more like a backend thing. You can secure your, your front-end routes or whatever, but that's still more like UX than it's security. But if it comes to like cross-site scripting or whatever, something front-end to worry about, I think we have to ensure that we're not just malicious, inserting malicious code um, into HTML. Um, so it's definitely not, not only a backend thing. It's definitely also not only a front end. Uh, it's 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 a, a thing that exists in, in in the entire application architecture. It's either the, either the network, the the APIs, the front end. I think it's important that everyone that 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 works on any part of, of an application that that ensures that security is 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 considered properly. Uh, I think in the end, no one wants to be responsible for any leakage. Uh, it's not about knowing who we can blame, but it's about ensuring that we as a team are not to be blamed by anything that could, could leak. I think that's very important because you shouldn't underestimate the fact that if something leaks and it's your fault, that yeah, it's not going to be a good, good, uh, good situation to be in. And then maybe this is like a, maybe this is like an off topic thing, but um, what about security and open source projects? So I heard about this one case where uh, somebody took over a, a project, a maintaining a project, and then all of a sudden uh, they in, they like installed the Bitcoin mining software into anybody who installed that library. I don't know if you guys heard was, of that. It was more malicious than that even. Yeah, uh, this is an event stream last November. It, it actually was code that that looked for your wallet and tried to steal your private keys so it could take oh. your entire wallet. I'm talking about this this weekend and in Amsterdam next weekend if anyone wants to to come check that it out. Exciting. Look at that plug. Effort hey. plug into the conversation. <laughs> yeah, that, that was that, that was a monster uh, exploit and uh, is really just like the tip of the iceberg and was only coincidentally noticed because of a deprecated API in Node. There's no reason to think that that is not currently happening on other uh, packages. Well, it's actually also kind of interesting because, you know, what do we tell the larger corporations who decide to fork everything and make it their own? Like, the, you know, something like that is a very good example of why they'd want to do that. So, like, should we be encouraging people to do that? Or well, there's tools out there. So at Shutterstock, we use a tool called Sneak that yeah. we've just implemented. 
It does uh, security audits on open source packages. It also does, you know, alerting and things to say, hey, your versions are out of date, you know, kind of forces you to keep things up to date, make sure that you're not getting hit with vulnerabilities. And GitHub just announced that they took over, uh, let me recall the name of it, it was Botify or, or something, what was it called? Um, Dependabot, and I think Greenkeeper is another one. Um, and those are all really good tools for helping these projects. Uh, anyone that has a large corporation down to small projects, make sure that they're not getting stung by those types of vulnerabilities, or if they do get stung with them, they address them as quickly as possible. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that we learned from that attack, and I mean, Jared, you can you can fill in with more details too, but is that realistically, when you examine all the different actors and what they did, nobody did anything particularly malicious in that situation. Um, the person that I understood, the person that made the change that ultimately added the malicious code, had looked like a you know a, a core team member had made you know meaningful and reasonable updates to the system previously, and when you know this the, the original author just didn't have the time to maintain the library full time, the person asked for push rights so that he could maintain it on his behalf, um, and he granted it. And this is something that happens my understanding all the time this is not an, an extraordinary circumstance nobody dropped the ball here right there was no clear way to know this was going to happen but i think one of the things that could have prevented it and i think reason why companies shouldn't be so scared is the takeaway my understanding of that takeaway is just if your build system when it's deploying or it's making a new build is automatically pulling in the newest versions of libraries you have to stop that like you, you have to lock down your dependencies and make the increase in version numbers. Yes, it needs to be something you do consistently, but it needs to be something you do manually. Um, because usually these issues will find, come up uh, right away in the first couple of days after something like this happens. And it's those people who had the build systems that were just, you know, they were just doing version tracking. They would accept any change up to a point their build system deployed and all of a sudden they crashed. And um, that doesn't just happen with security issues, that happens with bugs in code too, or incompatibilities. Uh, you just don't wanna suck up the newest code on every single build. Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's kind of related to, to- To jump in on that, I think, even though I, I'm a big fan of stuff like the Pandabot and Greenkeeper, I think you can, you can also argue the fact that such changes can also jump in by the Pandaba or Greenkeeper, depending how malicious they are, they might be detected or they might be, might be not. Even though I, I, I like using those tools, I think it's also worth thinking about if, whether or not it's a good idea to update too much automatically. I'm not sure what you guys think. Yeah, I think, I mean, just, uh consuming anything that is external to your company uh, or project is an extreme risk and for a very very long time uh, the industry has progressed extremely quickly kind of disregarding that risk um, developer machines internal to companies are given a lot of access and developers uh, run just about whatever they download and it gives a sense of um, there's a sense of kind of overconfidence there that they know a lot about computers uh, and they, they can figure out uh, what's good and what's bad. Uh, but the problem with a lot of these tools uh, where we're installing dependencies or, or other tools we're using is that they reach out to so much and pull in so much. And yes, you should lock your dependencies certainly, but how many people are actually doing a, fully, a full audit on the first set of dependencies that they've installed? And if you're not doing that first audit, then all you're doing is is locking whatever happens to be malicious to that version. Um, and you're you're hoping that nothing is malicious or nothing is problematic there, or nothing has a wild security exploit. But I mean, there's just so much that you're pulling in that it's very very difficult to really be sure. And I, mean, I, I don't have a good answer here. Uh, it's actually it's kind of a a disappointing state of things, um, but there there really is no silver bullet, one concrete way going forward. That kind of sucks because you know, um, you know, frameworks right are supposed to help with accessibility and performance and optimizing this and that and whatever. But like, what about you know? I mean, is somebody kind of to come up with like? the most secure framework or are, are, have frameworks built in anything related to security that help this problem? 
Uh, it's, it would be hard to build something nowadays without depending on a lot of what has been built before you. And those dependencies are really where you put a lot of risk. Mm. Like that, uh, so specifically that event stream exploit, it was one, one silly dependency that got updated with a malicious code uh, and then was immediately updated afterwards so that it kind of tried to hide itself. But then what it was doing was just so targeted, like it, it had exploited millions of computers that download that package, but it was just such a weird exploit in order to get into one build machine on one mobile application somewhere in the world to, to steal Bitcoin. Um, it's just it's attackers will find a way in to get where they want to go. And building one giant security uh, magical box uh, that everyone uses just makes that box appealing to target and attackers will inevitably find something. It's just it's impossible to get completely secure. So as a beginner, it sounds really exhausting. It's like, oh my God, really? I have to learn the security thing now. So like, what's the tip for the beginners besides using that library that James said? <laughs> <laughs> or that cool library, I don't know what it was, but. I think if, if, if people are, are uh, if don't know exactly what to be targeting, uh, then starting with OWASP is a good first step. It's the Open Web Application Security Project. It's a not-for-profit company uh, that has groups all across the world, and they define threats. Uh, they they talk about solutions. They have best practices. Uh, it's a good place to stop if you don't know what you don't know. So going there is a, is a good way to uh, get it up to date on terminology. So when you know that there's kind of this vague threat, what is it called so that you can Google it later? Uh, definitely a good place to start. And I right. think another good one too, and it, we have a question in our chat that kind of follows on this, is back to the, the GitHub model of what they're trying to do, is looking at how we can start preventing these things from getting published in the first place. Uh, putting checks and balances in place in your build scripts that can ensure the stuff that gets published is good. Now, if you hand over complete rights to a repo, obviously there's always that risk. And I don't know if the community really wants to give up all of that, but trying to put the tooling in place that does these security audits. If you're a beginner, those are, you know, good ways to know that like the stuff that I'm working with or I'm publishing, you know, is I can have some amount of assuredness that this thing is is cleaned, it's verified, uh, that it's gone through some security. I've had multiple projects where developers are asking me, hey, can I add this package? And you know, you do your best to audit and go through it, but if there's some sort of way to see that the thing that's been published has been had an, a security aud audit through it to get a sort of trust level ingrained in it. I think that will help move things a long way. And I think GitHub's very much moving in that direction as a lot of places are. Yeah, there, there's a lot to unpack in a lot of GitHub's announcements over the past few weeks. Uh, there's a lot of yay, great, and a lot of things that you can easily question, um, but I think Tying the uh, the source code development and the authors and the commits directly to eventually uh, the package that you're installing is a really important first step because every layer of indirection between authoring uh, and eventual distribution allows for the source to be obfuscated, uh, the intent to be obfuscated. And with JavaScript nowadays, a lot of times we have the original source. Uh, then we have internal build artifacts like minified JS, babelified JS, and then you have a tarball that exists somewhere. And then each one of these steps makes it harder to understand what the intent was behind changes, which makes it more difficult to do uh, an audit. So I think GitHub's moving in the right direction, but definitely consolidating everything has its own uh, consequences. And I think a big part of what we're talking about here with security is just like all the other parts of architecture, right? We're talking about trade-offs. So when, when we tell you that there's a lot of things that can go wrong, both in the way that you get your dependencies and the way that you build your applications, the point isn't to scare you into never making software again or never using software again. It's just to let you know whether you realize it or you don't realize it, that you're making trade-offs every day. So for example, uh, you know, the question about how can we make NPM more secure, can we require security audits? Well, when you talk about stuff like that, can the approach scale? You know, who will do these audits? How often, who does it apply to, right? Does it apply to me if I just want to push a little code 
sample that I have to my own GitHub account? Do I have to get a security audit for that? How many people need to download it before that becomes required? When people do those audits, how can we trust the people doing those audits? Because they're going to be, they're going to be uh, susceptible to the same types of intrusions or social engineering um, issues that other types of organizations could, could, could become susceptible to, right? Everything with security is a bit of a trade-off. And so when you're talking about using these libraries and companies being scared of using these libraries, I think you have to balance that against the alternative. If I made it all myself, would my version of it be any more secure? Sure, maybe it doesn't have a key logger. It might not have this uh, Bitcoin hack that this one person got in, you know, but maybe all of a sudden I'm trying to roll my own version of Bcrypt because I'm scared. And all of a sudden all my, my user accounts get stolen. And now that's millions of dollars because I was afraid of, of using a different package. So even if you choose to opt out of using this system, you're still making an affirmative decision to trade off on having to spin your own solutions and I mean, Jared, you can speak to, I'm sure all the times you've seen this, that probably rolling it yourself, unless you're an expert, and honestly, even if you're an expert, is probably the wrong call most of the time. Yeah, I think, I think there's there is absolutely a lot of trade-offs there. I'm actually, I'm, I'm intrigued um, with Ryan Dahl's newest creation, Dino.js. Um, I'm not sure where that's gonna go, but but it's essentially, it's, it's a node-like environment, not compatible, but node-ish. Um, but one of its uh, core de design philosophies is a greater security in nature. So at the, at the core of that, um, or one of the, the biggest features there is a set of privileged APIs that are just inaccessible unless you've said, yes, it's okay for you to do this. So obvious things like uh, IO access, network access, um, having things like that in our uh, runtime environments at least allows us to do an audit on all the privileged APIs. So if you have a dependency that you have previously audited and said, OK, you can do x, y, z things, then all of a sudden updated to do a, b, c things, you know that it's going to have to go through some sort of uh, new audit process in order to figure out what has changed. Awesome. So let's uh, move on. And let's talk about probably the first thing that everybody thought of uh, when, when they heard about security, right? It's some, for some people, it's the all of security, which is passwords. Um, so passwords, there's two sides to passwords, right? There's uh, users and, and us as, as consumers of services making passwords, sharing passwords, changing passwords. And then there's us as developers who are storing those passwords and accepting those passwords. Um, so again, a broad topic. Uh, let's start maybe with some best practices um, with the as developers. So let's talk about like developers. How do we handle passwords? What are some of the easy tips or things that people that are just joining a team maybe can ask questions about or or investigate themselves just to make sure that the team that they just joined, you know, is handling users' passwords properly. I can definitely jump in, but I feel very chatty right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you get us started and then sure. we'll let it roll off. Um, so the 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 core, without jumping into explicit uh, prescriptions on what should be done to store passwords, uh, I think it's important to understand why these recommendations have changed over time, uh, and that's because of really what you're trying to do to protect a password in the first place. You're trying to you're trying to take something that somebody's giving you and uh, later down the line assert that, that when they give you something else, it's the same thing that they gave you before. But you obviously don't want to store that secret because you don't want to be liable if it was released. But you have to have some way of linking secrets at two different points in time together again. So that's where people are using cryptographic hashes to basically do a one-way transformation of that secret into something that is meaningless so that you can do that same transformation down the line again in order to compare two meaningless things. Um, the problem with some cryptographic hashes is that they are very, very fast. Um, so if you're trying to test a lot of usernames and passwords or a lot of different passwords in one username, if you have this very fast cryptographic hash, uh, then you can churn through hundreds of millions in a very, very short period of time, which allows people to brute force passwords, credential stuff, um, a whole bunch of things. Um, but that there are, uh, there are strategies that apply concepts on top of cryptographic hashing in order to basically make the amount of effort it takes to generate that hash uh, flexible so that you can essentially make that hash generation as expensive as you need it to be so it just becomes unfeasible to run those massive attacks. Uh, so there is uh, Bcrypt and PBKDF2. Uh, those are uh, the current very highly recommended 
uh, passage storage algorithms. And those allow you to define a cost to the algorithm in the code so that you can make sure that it is, uh, well, with bcrypt, like a, a cost of 12, which means that it takes maybe about 200 to 300 milliseconds to generate that hash, uh, which means that if you're trying to, to generate hundreds of millions or billions of hashes, it's going to quickly become too costly because you're going to be just running into CPU bound concerns. So Frederick, you, uh, you you mentioned earlier that you were um, you, know, you came onto a team and and, and you identified uh, password issues you know pretty quickly on. So what are what are your thoughts like? What are things that people should be paying attention to, um, or asking questions about on on teams that they're on? Well, when it comes to passwords, I think it's also important to realize there's a difference between encrypting and hashing. Um, Jared already mentioned the one way. I think that's very important. Um, I've had situations where the passwords were encrypted because at some point we need to be able to read the password again. I think that's incorrect. I think you should never as a system be able to know the password without the user providing it. And that's why we hash and not encrypt. Um, so even though encrypt looks safe, it's it, there's always a way back. So it's making it easier to to, to steal a password. So I think using hashing is definitely something I always recommend. Um, or even not not rolling your own system to to handle authentication and not being the, the system that needs to worry about managing passwords. That in the first place is probably a good idea. Like you can use systems like Auth0 or whatever. Great. How about you, James? Like any any things that you've seen on systems you've worked on or things that you think people should be asking questions about or implementing as it relates to password management as developers? I, I take the uh, I don't know what I'm doing approach uh, to passwords. I've tried writing my own systems that do these before in the past and you know it, it feels safe enough but as these attacks get more complicated and the different vectors you can get hit from uh, become more complicated and the costs associated with trying to maintain these systems and build these systems, I've really converted to trusting in experts like Google and, and Auth0. I've used Firebase authentication a lot. I've used Auth0 authentication a lot. Uh, I like those as, as you know, these software as a service platforms that, that can take that burden off my shoulders uh, and not have to make me worry about the things that we're talking about and not worry about which algorithms and the costs and things. It's, They've got a good system. They've got a good interface for it. They help me integrate it. They maintain it. And all I have to worry about is just making sure that, you know, I'm following their best practices and the things that they're asking me to do to make sure that my products are secure. It, it really does make life a lot easier in terms of uh, getting new ideas to market with security still at the forefront and best practices still adhered to with minimal effort and cost. Absolutely. And I, I I was thinking while we were talking, I was thinking about this, and Jared, I might have gotten this from you originally, but there was a study that came out a couple months ago where uh, at some university they had basically paid some subjects, some web developers, to, to build like a simple system. And part of the system sort of incidentally was that they were going to have to do credentials. It wasn't like explicitly stated what to do, but they it was part of the project. And what it turned out was that the vast overwhelming amount of people either stored the passwords in plain text or used it in, like Frederick was saying, used an encoding scheme, not like a hashing scheme that could just easily, like not even, you know, necessarily need a private key or anything like that, just like a base 64 encoding and then just revert it back out. And so I, I just say that to say that it's easy sometimes to hear these best practices and go, I'm not that stupid. Like, I, of course you wouldn't store passwords in plain text, but you will surprise yourself and your team will surprise you and you will surprise your future self by the decisions you make um, under a time crunch when you don't when you're not being cognizant of these things. Yeah, I think it. You, so I, I'm a I'm a security person now, yay! Uh, but like I was saying before with Minecraft, uh, there was a time where I had three passwords. I had my crap password, which I used for everything. I had my my semi good password, which was used for sites that had my credit card information. And then my super secret password that I used in either one place or maybe just like my my banks and I don't know and then I have my Gmail password maybe so maybe I had like three and a half, um, and that was because I I knew enough to be dangerous but not enough to be effective in my security practices, 
And now that I have uh, I have grown up and learned a lot more uh, about security, I understand all the different ways every single choice can bite me. And uh, it has definitely enlightened me in ways that allow me to make better decisions as to what the trade-offs are. And I think uh, if you don't know what the threats are and you don't know how things can damage you in the future, uh, it's easy to think that like, oh, this choice isn't that big of a deal. Or uh, this forum doesn't need to be protected as well as my bank uh, or things like that. And that's true, but it's not a totally protected, unprotected situation. You, there are still dozens of choices you can make in the middle uh, that all have consequence and they all have value once you understand the threat model behind them. I think what would actually be really amazing is, uh, so like, I don't know if there is already, but what if, you know, adding to your build pipeline is like some sort of like security check, right? It's like, okay, build, you know, Travis CI done or whatever, but like part of that is also a security thing. Um, and or I know for the website Ember add-ons, right? It'll it'll tell you kind of it has these like four or five different credentials of okay, like is this package X Y Z? You know how much is it used, etc. So maybe like as well, maybe npm can do this actually or something. But like having some sort of is this a secure package to use? That sounds beautiful. I don't know how it could be done effectively. Word, build it. <laughs> I know, so I, there are I know. static analyzers though right for security have you guys used them like yeah. they don't catch obviously everything right but they'll catch they can catch surprisingly sophisticated things sometimes though like cross-site scripting vulnerabilities or or things like that yeah they, they definitely can um there are there are a bunch out there uh i've just seen a lot of them uh just issue more warnings than uh teams really care to look at and whenever you have a tool that's just puking out warnings that people don't find valuable, then the whole thing is easy to ignore. And it's not that those people are ignoring those warnings incorrectly. It's just that when you have a warning for a vulnerability that exists in some sort of developer package that will never actually manifest into a threat that would hurt you in the future, then it's not worth fixing. And that's, that's the gradient of security that people need to be OK with. You don't need to fix everything all the time. Yeah, security security isn't a destination, right? Security is really a journey. It's a, something yeah. that you are. I mean, not not to get too fortune cookie about it, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So I mean, I think, you know, we kind of talked about this a little while ago, but I think it's useful to roll back uh, to this idea that we've spent what is it forty minutes now scaring the pants off of people about all the ways that they can be attacked and the stuff that they're doing is dumb and their systems are probably leaking data. And they're sitting there saying, well, I'm not a security expert, right? Like I'm not, I, I, should I be, you know what I mean? Like, sh should we be hiring somebody? Should I leave this company? Am I legally liable? People are a little bit scared, right? So maybe one of the topics we can do kind of here near the end is maybe are there practical things that people that are hearing maybe some of these security things for the first time, or maybe they kind of know, and this has been in the back of their head, but they just haven't done it. Like, are there some practical things that they can do to, to start their team off on the right path? But James, do you have any suggestions? I, I think it kind of goes back to what we have kind of covered from a couple of different areas, which is just take the time to kind of learn some of the basics about where you might get attacked from and utilize where you can uh, tools or experiences or best practices from people that have already learned these lessons or otherwise do keep an eye on them. You know, and Auth0 is constantly, they have one of the most amazing dev blogs and they cover all kinds of topics, but they often talk about security. Um, you know, seeing what's out there, paying attention to that stuff. I know when the event stream issue uh, happened, I, I caught it from Twitter and, you know, and immediately, you know, they had, by the time it had made sort of the Twitter sphere, there was already a command you could run to see if you were impacted. Uh, so I, you know, immediately sent that out to all the teams that I operated with or, uh, had interaction with say, hey, you know, run this across your your tooling to make sure that you're not impacted, and if you are, you know, fix it. Uh, so that was a pretty. That's another great way to sort of keep an eye on these things. How about you, Shadow? Yeah. Do you have any advice? For you? Um, I'm sorry. Um, well, the thing um, I wanted to talk about. Um, 
it's important to note that also when, you, like if you're using a framework in front end, for example, in my case, I'm using mostly Angular, uh, even though it's scary, all the security kind of stuff, if we're if we're mostly working on the front end, a, a framework like Angular has a very nice documentation mentioning a lot of security things. Probably also worth knowing that a lot of the security stuff is done for you. So mostly in case of Angular, you often have to, or probably shouldn't, but in case you need to use bypass stuff to bypass the security, uh, in case you want to insert scripts that you're aware or you're sure of not being malicious. Um, so even though it, it is scary, as you mentioned, Rob, I think it's also important to note that a lot of work is done for us in case of front-end developers, for example. But this still doesn't mean that you shouldn't read the docs to ensure what's what's out there in the framework when it comes to security, if, in case you're copying stuff from Stack Overflow, which we all do eventually one day. Uh, if it includes something like a hey, bypass security trust HTML, you don't want to insert that if you're not sure what you're doing, even though it might work. So yeah, you still have to be sure to understand the docs. Great. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, I, I took a, um, a security course as part of my master's program. And I remember the, the teacher of that course saying, you know, I can't teach you in a semester everything you need to know to build secure software, but I can teach you enough that you can ask the right questions on a team. And so I think I think that's the takeaway from a lot of this is there are a lot of ways that a system can go wrong, but the things that you can offer to your team, even if you know nothing else about security, is just to uh, educate yourself, which isn't to, I mean, to know this stuff at the deepest level, but maybe follow a couple security people on Twitter so when major vulnerabilities are announced, you find out about it, right? Like, or you hear about it, and then you can ask your team about it. Um, go to the OWASP site and see some of the common vulnerabilities and some of the common mistakes that people make um, so that you might notice them yourself. And lastly, just ask questions. Questions are free, right? And, and sometimes you can sit there on a team and go, guys, are we, are we handling this password right? Like I had my Chrome DevTools open and I could see my password in my DevTools. Is that a problem? Like, is that plain text? Can that be read by someone? And it might be that your team talks through it and goes, no, 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 you can see that. That's, you know, that's only something you can see. You don't have to worry about that. But just the act of asking and having to have a conversation about it can, you know, help uncover that kind of stuff or at least um, help you learn more about, about security. How about you, Jared? Do you have uh, other tips for people? Yeah. Uh, on the, on the uh, just knowing what you don't know front, if you're at any reasonable size company, you undoubtedly have a security and a fraud team, go talk to them. Uh, if, you, if you have a fraud team, uh, they will blow your mind at how your software is being taken advantage of uh, by people who are, exist to specifically defraud people. Um, and the, the security and fraud teams are often uh, resigned to the belief that they just kind of have to react to what exists and then when a problem exists, roll everything back up to development teams. But if you start to bridge that gap now, then you'll be seen as a leader in your company very, very quickly because you're taking care of problems before they manifest. And ask for a, a pen test. That's, that's Especially if you've got enough seniority to kind of ask for those things. I've gone through a couple of them and they basically get some white hack, hacker to, you know, pound away at your site and see if they can't find a vulnerability. And they're really eye-opening uh, watching how they do some of the things that they do and the approaches that they take. And you know they're happy to show you a lot of times what that looks like so that you start thinking about these are things that I should expect to see or these are things that we should always be cognizant of. They're, they're really eye-opening experiences if you can get uh, one of those done to your, your projects and your sites. Great. Tracy, did you have a tip for anybody? Yeah. So, I mean, as I was talking about different tools and everything like that, obviously James brought up, how do you say it, James? Is it SNCC? Uh, SNCC, SNCC. I, I think even the people that work there don't entirely know. I, I would love to be corrected. I would it, love it, to know exactly SNCC. how. SNCC? All right. Yeah. Perfect. So there's these amazing stickers, SNCC Snickers, stickers that I have a lot of. Uh, <laughs> And the reason I have them actually is because um, they are a Node.js member. And since I do community relations for Node under OpenJS, um, they brought a bunch of cute 
gave me a bunch of cute stickers to send out to the community. So if you use sneak slash snick slash snake, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> uh, you know, you can tweet, uh, ask me on Twitter at Lady Lee and I'll send you a few. I know James wants some, but funny. There right? you go. I didn't know what they did until just now. <laughs> now we have a potential second sponsor to go with Firebase. You know, we'll yeah. just keep <laughs> Oh, you want right. security? Always enforce your Firebase security rules. The amount of people that I have seen that go, oh, I'll write those rules later. I can easily, through a CLI, hit your database and wipe out everything if you don't secure them. Always enforce your Firebase security rules. That's definitely true. <laughs> Even on a side project. Um, Even on that project. Great. Okay, so we will wrap up that topic here for today. Now, obviously, there was a lot of security that there's still to get to. I mean, we touched ever so briefly on pen testing and uh, operational security, all sorts of things. So we will circle back to this topic. If there's anything that you guys out there want to hear us talk about in the realm of security, either things that we covered now or, or uh, in the future, you know, of course, let us know. But uh, as we wrap up this podcast, as we do many times, we like to celebrate something about the culture at this.labs. And uh, this recently, Frederick, one of ours, you know, who's with us today, uh, told us to make the music channel so that people can start sharing their musical taste and talking about the music that they that they listen to um, every day while they work. So my question to you all is, do you have favorite music that you listen to either while you work or while you code and whether it's different? And uh, as usual, I'll start out. And mine isn't too crazy, um, but if I'm gonna go deep in the flow, then it has to be EDM music. No vocals, just a nice drumming rhythm, just high BPM so I move fast. Like if I'm going to be in deep flow, that's it. If I'm doing code reviews though, I can't do it. I can't move fast enough to keep up with it. So code reviews I do uh, on Pandora, there's like a classical for studying station, still no lyrics, but a much slower pace. That can also help me fall into the flow. So that's, that's, that's my, I go from extremely fast to extremely slow. So how about uh, Frederick? I, I kind of listen to all sorts of music. It basically depends what, what mood I'm in, I think. But if I really have to pick a favorite, I think it comes down to, to drum and bass, um, which also, always also, as you mentioned, Rob, allows me to, to have a feeling that I'm working on the beat, which gives me the feeling I'm working pretty fast or, or typing pretty fast and stuff like that. Yeah, it, it, can keep me, it can keep me going, but I can also enjoy working on, on some slower music, uh, even with lyrics. Uh, I think it doesn't matter for me. Uh, but drum and bass mostly, yeah. Great. How about you, James? What are you rocking out to when you're working? Uh, I have been in, in the music scene for a pretty decent amount of time, and I really enjoy Deep House. So I have a very heavily curated uh, playlist on Spotify that I'm always adding and plucking from. And that's, that's my go-to for everything. I pretty much just have that playlist on repeat. Awesome. How about Jared? What do you what do you what do you got? Uh, it alternates kind of similar to what you've got. I think when I when I need to get more motivated, uh, I've got a chip tunes playlist. Chip tunes for anyone who doesn't know, it's like a old school synthesized music based around like eight bit style uh, audio. So it's like a kind of like a a fast electronic uh, rocky uh, eight bit video game. And I don't know what that does to my brain, but it turns part of it into a uh, motivated, get shit done uh, attitude. And then <laughs> outside of that, on the other side, uh, brain.fm, which is uh, a website that kind of generates, or programmatically generates audio to get you in a focusful state. So if I can share one thing to people, because you made me think about it, is to mix my answer with, if people are, uh, are, are gamers as well. There is a YouTube channel which broadca broadcasts live, like radio, it's called Radio Cutman, C-U-T-M-A-N. And they do um, lo-fi remixes of classic video game music, generally from like the SNES era, but but there's some newer stuff in there as well. And uh, it, the catalog isn't super large, so I have to, I have to take breaks from it, but um, that's a good, if anybody wants a nostalgia trip and they used to play games when they were a kid, that's a good place to go. How about you, Tracy? What are you what are you rocking out to when you when you're working? So one thing I love, if you guys have never heard of um ever heard of uh Girl Talk. Has anybody heard of Girl Talk before? Yeah. So I love Girl Talk. So 
I can listen to that all day, every day, which is awesome. Uh, my friend Jay doesn't like it though, because he's like, no, you only played 30 seconds of a song. But it's basically this like huge mix up of songs or I'll just to listen to like one song on repeat for like 10 hours, which maybe sounds a little crazy, but it helps me get in the mode, right? Like I'm not thinking about the lyrics anymore. It's just background noise. Um, so most recently it's been the, the Fighter by Carrie Underwood and Keith Urban, so. Rock on to that country. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, that'll do it for us. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode on security. And thank you, all of my co-hosts, for joining us. As I often say, the conversation doesn't stop here. Um, if you want to reach out to us and find us online to ask questions about anything that you heard or things that you know about security or any other topic that you want us to cover, uh, please do that. So you can find me uh, online at... Rob O'Cell, so that's R-O-B-O-C-E-L-L. -L. Tracy, you can find online at Lady Leet, L-A-D-Y-L-E-E-T. Um, we still need to get you to update that to Lady Yeet. I think we were just talking about that on, on Twitter a couple weeks ago. Or Lady. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Jared, you can find online at J-S Overson, J-S-O-V-E-R-S-O-N. James, you can find online at MySpivey, so M-Y-S-P-I-V-E-Y. And Frederick, you can find, of course, he had to have the longest uh, Twitter account profile, but you can find him at his name. So that's at F-R-E-D-E-R-I-K-P-R-I-J-C-K. All right. So thank you, everybody, for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.